thank uh, Mike for uh, agreeing to do this, and I welcome all uh, the participants, all the uh, guests uh, uh, assembled today to listen to the talk. I won't uh, take too much of time, and I will uh, pass on to Mike. Before that, I will uh, request everybody to mute their uh, microphone so that we'll have an uninterrupted uh, talk from Mike. Over to you, Mike. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you so much for hosting me, and uh, yeah, for this opportunity to talk to you all tonight, or this morning, uh, for some of you. Uh, so yeah, um, <clears throat> as as uh, Kapu mentioned, I'm a uh, assistant project scientist at UCSD, uh, that's the University of California, San Diego, and uh, today I'll be talking to you about machine learning and acoustics theory and applications uh, in a couple um, applications just from from my own research. And uh, this work was uh, performed in collaboration with my supervisor, uh, Peter Gerstoff, as well as um, our collaborators in um, Sharon Gannot uh, in Israel at bar -Alan University, as well as uh, Efren Fernandez Grande at a Danish Technical University. So I'll just start by giving you a little uh, bit about my, a little more about my background. So I started um, life as an aerospace engineer, and so I graduated from Purdue in 2007 uh, with an uh, aerospace engineering degree, and then worked in the aerospace industry um, for a number of years on uh, rocket engines. Was, and then um, at, in these jobs, I worked on a, you know acoustics and vibration, and I also had several other roles, but there's a much uh, younger uh, me standing in front of a rocket engine uh, from about 12 years ago. And trying to do the next slide. And so um, today, I'm a project scientist at the Marine Physical Laboratory at UCSD. And as Gopin mentioned, I, my PhD was in machine learning uh, and acoustics. And I'm continuing to pursue research in machine learning and acoustics um, with applications in acoustics generally, and also earth science and uh, ocean acoustics. And so um, there's already, I, I guess, just to start off my talk, there's already been many, many very useful and interesting applications of machine learning and acoustics. And so I'm not obviously not going to be able to touch on all of them, but there's some very interesting work uh, that's been done in um, ship localization. Uh, and some of this work I'll talk about uh, in seismic tomography, and this is not the only work that's been done, and also in um, understanding reverberant speech and how to um, address the issue of reverberation of multipath and acoustic environments so that um, uh, localization methods uh, can be robust to these effects. And also uh, in medical tomography, which is uh, very closely related to um, seismic tomography work. And I'd just like to mention that we have a uh, extensive review paper on machine learning and acoustics. And this is performed uh, with uh, my supervisor, uh, or written with my supervisor, Peter Gerstoff, and several of our other collaborators, including, including also um, Sharon Gannett, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but this is a comprehensive review uh, that has a, uh, what I think is a, a very accessible introduction to machine learning theory. And we also touch heavily on deep learning. And also uh, we talk about um, source localization in a couple different contexts, as well as the, um, you know, important developments in bioacoustics and uh, human perception of sound. So this is actually freely available online, and here's the DOI, and you can just find it by Googling this, this title too. And so I'll start by giving uh, a brief overview of machine learning in acoustics and just a little bit of the theory, and then I'll dive into uh, the applications that I've, that I've studied. And so uh, generally in machine learning, uh, we're interested in training a model to produce some desired output given inputs. So F is the model that we're trying to train in some way. And what we would like to do is based on some set of features, make, make a prediction about you know, what they are. And so uh, you know, in general supervised learning, we have labeled examples for each output. And in the other kind of learning, unsupervised learning, there are no labels. So in one, you're training a system to make some kind of decision or some kind of prediction based on the input. And in unsupervised learning, it's a lot less well-defined, yet also potentially very useful, as we'll discuss. But in general, the goal is to find interesting properties from X um, you know, in, a, in an automatic way. And this allows us to exploit uh, very large data sets, um, which, you know, for which labeling is very expensive. 
And so with these two methods, we basically have just the features or features and outputs, and we train the model. And so this kind of approach is most relevant to scenarios where we don't already have some physical model or some simple physical principle can't be uh, already applied. Otherwise, in trying to train a system, you're just mostly going to be reinventing the wheel, quote unquote. And so you'd be better served um, you know, uh, using this on problems that don't uh, admit to um, simple solutions. And so here is just an example. We have um, a, a neural network with the inputs X and the outputs Y, and then these are the features, these are the outputs, and we train these weights basically to give us the, the um, output that we desire for each example. And so just to bring home the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning, again, we have uh, for each um, data set of set of features that we have, we have a response variable or a label. And again, you know, a very simple example of supervised learning is just linear regression, or in this case, polynomial regression. And um, again, for unsupervised learning, there are no labels. And so what we do is try to exploit, exploit the uh, latent structure of the data. And so this, for instance, would be principal component analysis, just trying to find the directions in the data that have the greatest variation. And you can imagine how this might be really useful for very high dimensional data sets, right? Because in general, um, yeah, measurements, especially like images and audio and acoustic time series are very high dimensional, but the signals that they're actually, uh, that are useful contained within the data tend to be low dimensional. So as a first cut, you can take principal components uh, of this data uh, and visualize, you know, what might be the more important features uh, within your data set. So it's really useful. And there's lots of other examples for both of these. These are just sort of the more, most basic. Um, but as I'll talk about more, there's neural networks uh, for uh, unsupervised learning. These are known as autoencoders, or just that's just one flavor of them. Uh, there's also k-means, the clustering approaches, dictionary learning, which is closely related. I'll talk about that. And so, um, yeah, so I'll just do a couple more examples, and then we can get to the applications. Um, but in general, in machine learning, as opposed to maybe um, you know. Uh, conventional approaches where, you know, th that they're really useful that you have some physical intuition about the system and that you can program them. Often the data can tell you, uh, especially if you have a lot of data, the data can tell you what might be the best model uh, for the task that you're trying to perform. So we often prefer uh, learned representations, right? So here's an example in supervised learning where the goal is to classify uh, handwritten digits here. And this is the MNIST traded training set. And so there's about 60,000. Uh, images of uh, handwritten digits from zero to nine. And we just train this very simple neural network, right? But you can actually take a look at the weights and interpret the features. So this is just a very basic two layer uh, neural network, um, uh, often can be referred to as the multi layer perceptron. And so this has been trained on this corpus of images, right? And if we take a look, at just the weights for activating each each of the hidden layer units, we can see that these are, you know, if you kind of squint, you can see that these are little pieces of numbers, right? So this is the high level representation that the system thought was important for classifying, uh, ultimately classifying the data. So these would be higher level features, and then these would be uh, lower level uh, features. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, and so, uh, we actually did some work a while, uh, now, now a little while ago in um, doing unsupervised learning for ocean sound speed profiles. So you probably would find this interesting. That's Bianco uh, 2017 in uh, JASA. Um, but we also took a look at principal components in the context of uh, ocean acoustics where they're, where they're known as empirical orthogonal functions. And so again, this is just a case where we're trying to learn representation, right? And so here's kind of a nice canonical example of, uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people are interested in classifying uh, people's faces, right? But what are the most descriptive features of the faces? Well, one way that you can think about it is, uh, you know, what are the largest sources of variance in all these images? And so that is actually contained by performing principal component analysis on the faces, right? And so you can see the top 36 eigenvectors of, obtained from the faces contain most of the variation. And if we zoom out and look at the top 100, right? Uh, you start to get more and more and more noise, right? We can see the same to be true in terms of ocean sound speed profiles. So these were measurements obtained off the coast of San Diego in uh, Point Loma. And these are um, the, the uh, empirical orthogonal functions from that data, right? So we can see that the first several, you know, obviously correspond to some kind of uh, tidal 
frequency or variations at a specific depth, right? But then the later uh, dimensions are just noise, right? So uh, again, principal component analysis is really useful for um, you know getting some some uh, visualization of the variation in the data. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about clustering. So this is closely related, right? So how uh, can we use um, clustering to um, solve image processing tasks, right? So if you take a look at an image, um, little pieces of the image called patches actually represent uh, high dimensional vectors, in this case, the 8x8 patch. So this would be a 64 dimensional vector, right? And so you can actually say that if you look really closely here, that a lot of these patterns are about the same, you know, but they're just shifted or rotated versions of the same pattern, for instance, in the tablecloth and, and her uh, pants there. Um, but, you know, so one thing that can be done, and this will get us into dictionary learning, is you can basically cluster these high dimensional vectors and find, you know, the patterns that have been repeated, right? And at the same time, re if this image is noisy, also reject the noise, right? Because the noise will be living somewhere else, hopefully outside of this cluster. And so this is something I'll be talking about a lot more uh, for doing tomography. Um, so again, uh, just in learning the dictionary on the data of uh, on this noisy image, you can actually reject the noise. And this is called image denoising. And there's also a really interesting related task, um, you know, saying that if these image, these uh, pixels are corrupted, then you can inpaint, right? Assuming that the patches are much larger than the corruption, it's very easy to actually just remove them. And so this might have some interesting applications in cases where, you know, we actually don't have coverage, right? Uh, for, you know, we have some sort of uh, lack of coverage of rays or uh, sensors in an ocean or seismic environment. And so uh, this slide shows um, the somewhat of the relationship between k-means and uh, and dictionary learning, in this case, the KSVD algorithm. And this is the algorithm we used in our 2017 uh, ocean acoustics paper. But the whole idea is, is that, um, you know, very similar to k-means, you initialize your dictionary with some sort of centroids. In this case, this would be just atoms in the dictionary uh, for a chemistry analogy. And then you would solve for that for the coefficients representing the data in terms of the dictionary using the sparse uh, um, sparse penalty, which basically just says that out of all of these uh, dictionary entries or atoms, that um, only few of them may represent any given uh, set of data, right? So K means you're only allowed to represent, um, uh, you only uh, are allowed to assign uh, one data point to one centroid. And so this is sort of related to that uh, for KSVD equals one. But we can see that um, as this is trained, uh, you know, you see the data is very nicely evenly divided into little chunks here. And so we exploit the noise and the structure of the data in high dimensions to essentially reject the noise and also find the patterns. And you can see that this, um, this you know, let's play one more time. that it um, converges pretty quickly here. So we'll see the same behavior uh, when we're looking at uh, seismic data. So I'll go to the next slide here. And so now um, these are the two applications I'll talk about. So the first will be travel time tomography with adaptive dictionaries. And this is in a our earth science context. And so in general, um, data from seismic arrays uh, can be used to estimate subsurface structure, just like uh, they're used in the ocean. Um, just like um, hydrophone arrays are used in the ocean, as well as uh, bottom seismometers. And there's just like many problems in acoustics and seism seismology and all our related fields, there's tons of seismic data, but little to no ground truth information or labels. And so we're going to pr propose an unsupervised learning based approach, which can potentially model uh, the data in higher fidelity than um, but just conventional methods. And this paper was published in 2018 in IEEE transactions on computational imaging. And then we have, um, then later I'll talk about uh, source localization using deep generative modeling. So just like in seismology, uh, you know, we have very few labels, um, if any. And this just assumes that if we do have some labels, that we can exploit the structure in the unlabeled data to get some, some benefit. So we propose a semi-supervised learning approach, which exploits both the uh, unlabeled data and the few labels that we have. And um, 
This is all based on deep generative modeling. So this is a deep learning technique for um, teaching a uh, neural network um, how to model uh, uh, the structure of a set of data. And this is all work that's um, currently in revision uh, right now, and hopefully we'll be uh, re re resubmitting this soon. So, um, so now I'll start on uh, dictionary learning and travel time tomography. So not to belabor this too much, but if you have a seismic array, you can cross correlate the seismic noise uh, across across the array elements and get some kind of move out, right? And right, and if you know distance and you know time, you can get velocity. So we do the same, you know, the same thing across an entire array, right? And this allows us to formulate it as a linear, a linear uh, data data generative model here. So we have the data, we have our um, the the distance that each uh, ray travels through the the map, and then we have the um, slowness is just inverse of the speed which allows us to this, make this linear formulation and some sort of noise in this case we assume this is just additive noise sensor noise uncorrelated between the sensors and this is just an example of the kind of image that you can get with even the most basic kind of processing with this really powerful um, noise uh, ambient noise tomography approach and so this is actually an image of uh, southern california you can see the los angeles basin here and some high high velocity anomalies associated with the various mountain ranges here through Southern California. So very uh, in interesting what you can get just with noise. And so uh, we formulate this approach based on ambient noise tomography. And so uh, we assume that we have this dense ray sampling, right? And lots of uh, cross correlations. And what we do is we take this, um, you know, this image area or this, this um, sampling area that we have in the earth and we just break it into pixels and treat it just like a discrete, you know, a discrete image. And um, we say that small patches of this image are described by this local model. And this is a dictionary learning based model, right? Where we, we, um, we both say that these patches are have sparse representation in the dictionary, and then we also learn learn the dictionary here. So we constrain the small resolution features with dictionary learning. And then we constrain the overall model with the travel times. And uh, and so, and we alternate in solving this problem, we actually just alternate between these two problems uh, until we uh, converge to some sort of local uh, minimum. And so um, here's just an example of what this looks like in practice. So I have a very simple um, checkerboard pattern here through which we send uh, seismic rays. And uh, here is the global image. That's just the least squares estimate. And then we iteratively refine with our sparse model and you'll be able to see this actually converge to you know, roughly the ground truth. And there is um, 20 dB of sensor noise in this case. And we'll also, what we'll also see is this learned dictionary will also converge and you'll see it look like little pieces of a checkerboard pattern. And so this is what this looks like when it uh, after it converges. And it actually converges rather quickly. This, this, uh, to run this simulation only takes about five minutes on my uh, laptop. And if you would like to run this code for yourself, it's actually available online at uh, my GitHub here. And uh, if anyone would like a link to that, I can be happy to send that to them. And so here's a couple of more examples from our paper on this on this approach. And we compared uh, locally sparse tomography, our uh, sparse modeling approach with um, uh, conventional tomography based on just a smoothness prior. So this assumes that there's some correlation between the pixels, whereas we don't necessarily assume that. That information is contained in the dictionary, which is learned automatically from the data. And here we have, uh, we can use the method with prescribed dictionaries, such as Har wavelets or the discrete cosine transform, but we get much better performance with uh, dictionary learning here, as you can see. So, and the reconstruction error is shown in the lower right-hand corner. But even with the uh, prescribed dictionaries, you still, better preserve some of the edges here. So we see that the best model, at least based on travel time residual from the conventional approach, is still a little bit noisy. And so, you know, it all comes down to like what uh, is the goal of the, um, you know, seismic interpretation here. But I think we can say that in general, I think you would prefer to use um, this locally sparse approach uh, over a conventional method. And so we applied this approach to um, a, a high, a very large seismic data set from um, Long Beach, California. And this paper was published in 2019 in scientific reports. And so here we have, 
an array of about 5,200 seismic stations. And this is an unusually dense array. One would not normally expect this, but we were able to um, use this data uh, as part of a, this actually came from a, a, a seismic survey uh, from an oil company. Um, but they, uh, we have all this data, it's about three weeks of data. And from those cross correlations, we get about 14 million ray paths. You can imagine all the rays between all these sensors here. And uh, we only considered, in this case, the one hertz vertical component. So this gave us uh, radially surface waves. And after quality control, there are about 3 million ray paths um, that we used. And so here's the image that we got using locally sparse tomography. And so, uh, you know, in, so the, the image is one thing and the interpretation is another. That's what tells you if anything in the image is actually really physically meaningful. And we actually saw something that no one had really seen before in any tomography result that's been published. This sort of lake, if you will, this large area of uh, high velocity. And uh, we realized that it actually correspond pretty well to the fault lines here, if you kind of uh, take a look at it for a while. Um, but it turns out that this high velocity anomaly can actually be explained by the location of this aquifer uh, in, um, in Long Beach, California. So. And, you know, in a way, we accidentally uh, came up with a tool to better characterize aquifers in uh, Long Beach, California. So this is just in one interesting result that we got. I think there's lots of uh, future potential for this. Um, we're already working on on some other um, uh, seismology papers um, for this, applying this method elsewhere. But this is a really interesting result, I think. And so, um, yeah, again, here's just a simulation assuming uh, what we know about the uh, just from boreholes around the area. But you can see that this high speed anomaly corresponds, you know, very well with with what we would expect from simulation. And so now I'll diverge just a little bit and uh, talk about autoencoders and then talk about deep generative modeling and variational autoencoders. And so I just talked about dictionary learning. And so autoencoders are actually a neural network analogy. Uh, to dictionary learning in PCA. So um, <clears throat> they're basically just neural networks that are designed to approximate their input. So they're kind of deceptively simple, right? But the whole idea is, is that since this lower, this uh, latent representation that you're learning is much lower dimensional than your input and your output here, that in order to accurately reproduce the output, these weights must learn something useful about the data. And so we can exploit that for a number of purposes. Um, so, uh, and, and as I'll explain, autoencoders with linear activation functions are, are, are very similar to PCA and dictionary learning, um, but where neural networks get a lot of their power is all in these nonlinear activations at the uh, hidden units here. And these are what really drive the increase in representational power and generalization capabilities um, for uh, neural networks. And so, uh, just a basic linear autoencoder, all it really is is just a, a series of, of matrix transformations from the input to the output, right? And if you try to solve this, this actually just has a closed form solution and, uh, from linear regression. And so uh, if we just take a look at what this thing's actually learning, so here's an example with a sinusoid uh, with noise, and we just take a little look at little snippets of this data, uh, 400, 400 samples in length. Uh, we can actually see if we hold um, each one of these, so we train this on the sinusoids here, or on this noisy sinusoid. And if we just activate each one of these hidden units after training and see what the output is, it gives you these, you know, basically the components of the sinusoids that you had together. So in a way, this with this very simple model, you're actually able to like unmix the signal. And so this is what we might expect to get with uh, PCA. However, uh, when you add these nonlinearities, this is where you get the real uh, representational power of the neural networks. And so in this case, nice, a nice, simple, but very useful example is, is just denoising speech, right? So here you have these complex spectrograms of speech, noisy speech. You train an autoencoder to reproduce the, the noiseless speech, and you're able to recover uh, very well um, the, true, the, the uh, true signal here. And so now I'll take a one step deeper and now talk about deep generative modeling. And you might be wondering what autoencoders have to do with this, and I'll get that to that in a second. Um, but in acoustics and many fields, many related fields, there's lots and lots of data, but very few labels. And so since we have lots and lots of data, one thing you can do is train a neural network to uh, 
learn how to generate the samples of the data. So just like an autoencoder, you're teaching it how to recreate the input. You can actually just teach a decoder how to model uh, fake samples here. So here I have a generative adversarial network set up, which is a very popular uh, and powerful example of uh, deep generative modeling. And so uh, to kind of motivate this a little bit, if you take a look at all these faces here that have been generated, like none of these people actually exist. So this, these are obtained uh, from the output of, of this um, uh, generative adversarial network, just sampling over this latent space, right? And so, you know, the whole idea is by learning to generate the data, you're hopefully encoding very useful features about the data that might be uh, useful for some kind of downstream task. And so I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, uh, but generally, uh, as, I, as I showed with GANs, you're sampling from this latent space, right? But the question is like, what, uh, you know, can for a given example, can you say like exactly what part of the latent space corresponds best to that example? And so one weakness of the GANs is that they really don't provide a conditional model for the latent space. And so uh, you can infer the latent code that's produced by the sample. And so, and so variational autoencoders help to address that in a way by, you know, using variational inference to uh, find this mapping, to find this mapping and also generate the data, right? So there's sort of two tasks here. And in performing those two tasks, you actually obtain not only a latent representation, but also a, uh, a very useful generative output. And so here's just an example. So again, we're just using an autoencoder, except for except now we're applying all of these um, stochastic functions to the input, the latent uh, model, and the output. And it sounds very complicated, but ultimately all we're doing is just a, tr uh, a, trans a uh, stochastic transformation of the input to a, a latent, a latent um, probabilistic model. And then from sampling from the late model, uh, a stochastic transformation of the uh, output model here. And so uh, this is really, it's really interesting in a way what you can do uh, with just a 2D, um, a uh, 2D uh, latent representation. Uh, if you have a, a Gaussian prior on your generative model and a 2D latent representation, you actually end up learning a 2D manifold of MNIST. So again, we're coming back to these handwritten digits. And so when you're sampling from this 2D latent space, you can not only see that they that they uh, some of the digits actually naturally cluster in this somewhat low dimensional space, right? This is just for visualization purposes. Increasing the dimensions would also push the the clusters apart. Um, but but you can see that you know six closely related to zero, closely related related to eight three uh, and nine and then four. So the system is able to automatically learn this. And so this is pretty, we are sort of inspired by this result to try to extend this to source localization. And so the whole idea is we're just gonna try to generate this RTF phase, right? So, we, so what we're trying to do is we have, uh, for instance, two microphones and we're trying to get um, the relative transfer function between them, right? And so what the system is going to do is it's going to learn how to generate the relative transfer function, and then it's also going to learn how to estimate the DOA or the direction of arrival of the given source. So this is uh, in the context of room acoustics, uh, but it's uh, very relevant to uh, ocean acoustic and also uh, seismic uh, source localization. And so uh, just to take a step back, uh, we consider these time domain acoustic recordings uh, from two microphones. And the RTF is just a very uh, simple estimator here. And we do that for each of F FFT frame. And then input to our uh, variational autoencoder is just a sequence of these frames. And so this is uh, work that uh, has already been published in the IEEE uh, workshop on machine learning for signal processing. And that you can find that online. And as I mentioned, we're working on resubmitting this paper um, to IEEE access. And so, uh, <clears throat> so the, in this case, variational inference is used to jointly train these generative and discriminative models. And we assume that this RTF phase sequence that I just introduced is generated by some random process in the latent space, right? Uh, as that's also a function of the source label. So we have our latent space and our source label. And Y here is, is called a one-hot encoding. And what it is, it's just we have, for instance, 19 DOAs for one of our data sets. And so in Y would be have 19 dimensions, but for the given one source that's active, uh, you would have a one uh, in, 
corresponding to that source location and zero everywhere else. And then we have our again our latent representation, and then Y is actually an output of another another neural network, um, as I'll discuss. And so um, we have you know these distributions right, and they're all parameterized by these neural networks. And so I'll try to explain that here. Um, so in general, learning VAEs, we use variational inference. So we're going to be doing a lot of approximation uh, with with um, uh, distributions. Uh, that are uh, parameterized by neural networks. So, as I mentioned, we assume some generative model for the data. So this is these are our RTS sequences, and we assume uh, that you know this model that we have is an approximation to the true data distribution, this p star, and this uh, model is pr uh, parameterized by neural networks. Meaning, here we have this um, this uh, generative model here. And we assume that um, it's just uh, generated by this truncan, truncated Gaussian distribution, where the mean and the variance of the distribution are just outputs of a neural network. So again, this is just a, a stochastic transformation of the neural network output. And so we use and we use the truncated normal distribution because the uh, the RTF phase. So this is sort of a, a prior knowledge that the RTF phase is going to be on the interval from minus pi uh, to pi. And so, um, <clears throat> and then in order to estimate this latent code, we have the very difficult issue of, of uh, which the um, generative adversarial networks don't do, which is estimating the code that might correspond to particular examples. So you can use that for inference here, or you can use that later to generate um, new RTFs. And so we have this, um, this approximate distribution here that is parameterized by another set of neural networks here. And again, we have our label inference or our, our uh, conditional distribution for the DOA given the RTF sequence. And again, this is just a, you know, in this case, a categorical distribution. So a um, classifier network uh, with, um, you know, just the distribution controlled by this parameter here. And an optimization, I won't touch on that here, uh, but we have our paper. It's actually available uh, on archive right now. Um, so if you would like more details of that, you can see them right now. Um, but uh, just just would like to say that the um, that these per, these distributions are basically compared to one another using KL divergence, and then uh, ultimately in all of the optimization that we do, the only thing that we're changing are the parameters of the neural network to effectively adjust these distributions such that they, in this case, fit the data, fit what we think should be the latent distribution and what we think should be the label. And so that's just a basic basic overview of that. And so as you might have guessed, we actually have three neural networks um, that are used to implement this. And I know this looks really complicated, but at the end of the day, all this is all these are doing is parameterizing these distributions. And so here we have network A, which is an encoder, Network B, which is an encoder, and A is for classification. B is for latent latent inference, and then C is our generative model. So we have some input Y, some output Z, and we can use this to generate uh, new samples of the RTF sequences. And so, as it turns out, uh, training the system on both labeled and unlabeled data allows you to perform a lot better um, on a given uh, source localization task than if you just only had access to the labeled examples. And so uh, in order to uh, validate this, we um, actually performed an experiment in, uh, at Danish Technical University. And this was performed by Efren uh, Fernandez Grande, one of our collaborators in um, Professor uh, Fernandez Grande in uh, June uh, 2020. And this is, uh, these are measurements were performed in a classroom with moderate reverberation, but you can see that the, the walls have lots of irregular features, which uh, actually gave some really um, nice uh, reflection patterns. And so um, the source range was fixed at one and a half meters, and we had uh, 10 DOA, uh, 10 degree DOA resolution over the, over uh, minus 90 to 90, which gave us 10 DOAs. And just to uh, test the system out in room acoustics, we used speech segments. And so we had about 20 speech segments in two to three, two to three seconds in length uh, with activity detection already applied. And then we convolved these with the impulse responses of the room to get our to get our data set. And so here we have the design case with 20 speech segments and the validation case with 20 other speech segments. And we had about 100,000 sequences total that we used. And so 
we can see that um, using uh, just uh, two tenths of a percent here, we're actually able to outperform in terms of uh, mean uh, absolute error and accuracy, uh, both the classic SRP FAT and the music algorithm, which are sort of uh, common benchmarks in uh, source localization and room acoustics. And we can see also that um, in the case of fully supervised convolutional neural networks, so in this case, we literally just trained the convolutional neural network with the exact same architecture as this, with just different outputs. And uh, we're, it was not, it basically overfit the labeled data, right? So the whole issue is, yeah, you have, you know, these three, these 250 labels, right? But like, how well can those labels actually generalize, generalize to unseen examples? Well, it turns out that actually, if you have a ton of unlabeled data, you can actually use semi-supervised learning to exploit that structure in the data, and then later use the labels to um, you know, give that some sort of physical meaning, right? So we can see that the system, it does very well basically from two tenths of percent and, and on. And again, these uh, results are available in the archive uh, as well. Uh, but another thing that we can do is uh, uh, these, since it's a generative model, we can interpret uh, what it's actually generating. And so, um, so here we reconstruct RTF phase using the train VAE. And so we, in, we um, we in, uh, as input, uh, so through the through the encoder, we push the um, the RTF training phase right, and we see what what we get out of the reconstruction. And so we can see that um, when we reconstruct the the input, it looks it looks okay, but it's actually difficult to interpret this right because it's sort of noisy because we're using you know uh, short um, short short uh, FFT windows here. Um, but if we take a look at the mean of the output, so this is the, the mean of the uh, decoder, it actually matches, give or take, roughly the, uh, the free space uh, RTF. So we thought that was really interesting. And we can see that the phase wrap uh, happens almost exactly where you would expect it, right? So the system is learning something physically meaningful uh, about the data. So in a way, this allows us to use not only you know, the semi-supervised learning technique, but also sort of keys us into you know, what it's learning about, right? So that's interpretability is very important uh, in machine learning. And so we actually then take the inverse Fourier transform of some of these um, RTF sequences, and we can actually see then that the, the mean uh, free space phase delay and the mean generated RTF delay are you know, almost exactly the same. So that was cool to see also. Um, but another thing we can do, just like you did with um, generative adversarial networks and uh, phase data sets, uh, you can actually just conditionally generate RTF phases, right? So you can pick a DOA from which you'd like data and then just sample, given the data, just sample Z from the prior here. Uh, and then that gives you, uh, then you sample from this distribution as defined by that. And so, um, you know, in a way these, uh, I can say that these RTFs don't exist, right? So these are synthetically generated, uh, yet when we interpret the uh, mean of them, we can see again that these, you know, are uh, very, physically meaningful. So this is inspiring uh, for us move, moving forward with this. Um, and so here's a uh, DOA of 90 degrees. And again, we took the inverse Fourier transform of this and uh, it corresponds very well to what we would have predicted for the time delay. And also um, we did uh, minus 30 degrees. And this again corresponds very well uh, to what we would have predicted for the time delay. Um, so I'll just wrap up on that and uh, leave leave some time for questions. Um, but I just would like to leave you know leave you with the impression there's there's many many interesting research opportunities for machine learning and acoustics. Uh, I've just touched on a few things, uh, mostly my own work. Um, but unsupervised learning, um, generative modeling are uh, ha I think have uh, lots of potential for development. Um, and you know, unsupervised learning is very important, right? Because I mean, most of the data that we have is not labeled. And so ideally you would be able to exploit um, structure of the data automatically. And only really only in this way can we truly exploit uh, large data sets. And so um, I'll just leave you with that. And I'd actually just like to thank again, the Office of Naval Research uh, for funding this work, as well as um, the European Union's uh, Horizon Grant. So thank you very much for listening.